In one sermon, a preacher by the name of Adrian Rogers said the following statement. Satan said, if I can't beat the church, then I will join the church. Friend, when you look for the devil, never fail to look in the pulpit. His ministers are transformed as angels of light. When you hear such a statement, does it not make you think? The devil will never present himself out in the open. He will never make a big announcement about his plans and his ways. No, because his aim is to deceive. And when you want to deceive, you can only do it by appearing to be something that you actually aren't. The devil will deceive by appearing to be an angel of light when he is pure, utter darkness. And so I believe that the devil will attempt to deceive the church by being in the church himself. One way to understand this is by reading the parable of the weeds in Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30. The Bible says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So what does this mean in regards to the devil? Well, God says the entire world is God's field. This parable is showing two different works being done in the world, and it further provides us with understanding as to why there is evil in this world. Jesus Christ plants good seed in this world, and that good seed becomes his children. That good seed becomes servants of the kingdom of God. That good seed will produce good fruit, fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. However, the devil also plants those who are his offspring. He plants his agents of darkness in this world and attempts to disrupt the work of God and destroy it even. The devil is the author of war and strife and deception, and he has been in this trade of deception for thousands and thousands of years. When the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he quoted scripture. He knew the Bible, but he was misusing scripture. He was distorting it to try and get his way. And he often uses this technique today. He will take a little bit of truth and mix it with lies. So how does the devil work in the church? What's his strategy against the church? These are some of the questions we ought to be asking so that we can identify the enemy when he's in operation. One of the devil's major strategies is that he creates division in the church. He attempts to divide and conquer. He knows that if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And have you noticed how some people wear divisiveness as a badge of honor? They approve of certain sins, calling them mistakes, and reject other sins and deem them evil. They approve a certain doctrine and crucify anyone who doesn't fall in line. This is the work of the enemy. The devil loves to sow division among God's people. He loves to pit one person against another. Do you know why? Because the Bible tells us that where two or three gather in the name of Jesus Christ, his presence will also be with them. And God's presence brings change. It transforms a person's life. And so the devil will look to make sure that people are not unified so that they will not experience the transformative power of God's presence. The other strategy that the devil uses in this day and age is the slight crossing of moral lines. This is where you have people who will say things like, well, that's not really a sin. You'll have people who will encourage you to reason with sin and start pointing out technicalities, extenuating circumstances, and all sorts of things. But really, all they are doing is enabling you to sin. 
When you find yourself compromising on small things, this is most certainly the devil luring and tempting you. You can think about a sin and say, I haven't done it, I've only thought about it. But let me tell you that imagination leads to fascination and fascination leads to action. Sooner or later, those little things you compromise on, those unclean and unholy thoughts, those small little actions, sooner or later, they will grow into the real thing. If you refuse to compromise now, it becomes much easier to resist compromise in the future. So win those small battles. Resist temptation in those moments when no one is looking. Reject the devil's advances in those moments when you're alone. As a child of God, you should give no room to the devil. Do not open the door for him to enter. Do not give him a seat at your table. Pray for the boldness to reject him, the strength to resist him, the power to turn away from his vices. Pray for eyes that really see truth from deception, light from darkness, and ears that really hear the truth from a lie. It's dangerous to walk around with a form of godliness when beneath the surface you are living a life that is not connected to Jesus Christ at all. If we're not careful, we can become susceptible to Satan's attacks without even realizing it. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Satan preys upon those who are on shaky soil in their walk with God. He preys on those who have a false pretense those who act like their Holy Ghost feel, but really aren't. The devil goes after the weak-minded, the undisciplined, the lukewarm believer. Don't let that become you. He goes after the one with no self-control, the one who has one foot in and one foot out. Don't let that become you. Instead, remain vigilant. Arm yourself for battle. Don't be caught unaware. When temptation comes your way, fix your eyes on what is right and true. When the devil looks at you, let him see a man or woman who is committed to Jesus. When you abide in the shadow of the Almighty, there is nothing Satan can do to pry us from his hands. When the devil looks at you, let him see no door for entry. Let him see no opportunity to exploit. We all have weaknesses, but we have to hand them over to God instead of letting the devil get a foothold in our lives. When the devil looks at you, let him see the full armor of God. Stand firm in the truth of the gospel so that when lies start shooting like arrows from the devil's mouth, they have no effect on you. When the devil looks at you, let him see a child of God. We have a heavenly father who has already claimed us and he is always surrounding us with his divine protection. If the devil looks at you and sees these things, he's rendered powerless, he's rendered useless. The Bible says that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Temptation may be strong, but the one who lives within us is stronger. And when all is said and done, we know who will ultimately win, and it is Jesus Christ. The end is already written. It's up to you and I to decide. Decide if you will be a victor or a victim. Will you be overwhelmed or an overcomer? So let the devil know that you are a child of God who is sanctified, justified, and protected by the blood of Jesus Christ. Make it abundantly clear that you are no longer His for the taking. Your heart has changed. Your allegiance has changed. Your mind has been transformed and renewed. 
So when the devil looks at you, don't let him see the weakness of your flesh. Instead, let him see the power of the Holy Spirit living within you. Let him see the image of the cross stamped on your heart, sealing you for all eternity. Jesus Christ has all authority over both the natural and supernatural world. God's word has authority over both the natural and supernatural world. I say this because many people are bound by evil spirits. Many people are chained by evil spirits. And I'm not talking about people who are possessed by demons and have completely lost all sense of reality. No, I'm talking about people who are functioning in society, but suffering in one particular area privately. And one of the biggest signs that someone is being oppressed by an evil spirit is that you will find them to be stuck in the same cycle. It could be a cycle of unforgiveness and bitterness where they are angry at one person after another and keep them caged up in your heart instead of letting go. There are other people who get stuck in cycles of alcohol and substance abuse. Or perhaps the cycle is one related to finances. You save and save, you automate your savings, but somehow there's always an emergency that takes you back into the minus. These are cycles. And I say cycles because if you carefully read the passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 to 18, the Bible says, And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, kneeling before him, said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Now it's clear the seizures were a result of demon possession because verse 18 tells us that Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. But what I want you to notice is that in verse 15, the father tells Jesus that the boy falls into the fire and often into the water. This demon had the boy in a repetitive cycle. He kept falling in and out of the fire and the water, the same scenario over and over again. This boy was bound by a demon. And this is what the devil wants to do in our lives. He wants to keep us bound, but Jesus wants us to have freedom. The devil wants to keep us chained to the same old sin and the same old outcomes and the same old situations. But Jesus Christ wants us to live in liberty and to experience breakthroughs. So if you find that you're stuck, You've moved from job to job and nothing has changed. You've moved from city to city, but nothing has changed. You've moved from job to job, but nothing has changed. You've moved from man to man, but nothing has changed. You've moved from woman to woman, but nothing has changed. You should call on Jesus Christ to deliver you and break the chains off whatever spirit is holding you back. Don't get accustomed to falling into the same cycle. Don't get used to the chains of the enemy. The Amplified Translation of Luke 10, 19 says, Listen carefully. I've given you authority that you now possess to tread on serpents and scorpions and the ability to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy, Satan, and nothing will in any way harm you. When you hold on to the word of God, when you have faith and claim the authority that you have been given by Jesus Christ, you can break free from every demonic stronghold. You can be free from every demonic chain and you can stay free. So you may be asking the question like, how can I break free from the generational sins and curses of my family? What can I do to stop the dysfunctional behavior in my life? How can I be set free from cycles of depression? My answer is to tell you that Luke 10, 19 says, 
you have been given authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Jesus Christ didn't die on a cross for you to be bound. He gave you power over the devil, and in the name of Jesus, there is curse-breaking power. In the name of Jesus, generational sins are broken. Now, I would like to give you three steps to make sure that you are always living in freedom and never bound by the enemy. The first step is that you should submit to the Lord and resist the devil. James 4 verse 7 tells us that if we will submit to God and resist the devil, that he will flee. But I believe that unless our lives are first submitted to Jesus Christ, then there is no way that we can effectively resist the devil. The second step is that you should walk in the truth. 1 John chapter 2 verse 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The Bible is telling us that there should be commitment on our part to walk in the standard set by God's word. If we call ourselves Christians, we are expected to act like it. If we want to be Christ-like, then we ought to act and strive to be more like him. The third step is that you should have faith in God's word. Have faith in the word of God as your life depends on it because it does. Romans 8 verse 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Saints, we have authority over evil spirits. And when you realize this, you will not tolerate the chains that the enemy tries to place on you. Instead, you will live in complete freedom and liberty. Whatever strongholds you face, you must not give up the battle. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 4, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, if there is one thing that I want you to know, it's that the devil is indeed our enemy and is trying to lead us away from God. He is trying to offer us the silver and gold of this world at the expense of our souls. However, if we are to succeed against the devil, we have to know the Word of God. The Word of God is a weapon, and so we must by all means know that we can only wage war with the weapons that God has given us. If we are to succeed against the devil, we have to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If we are to overcome him, we are to pray without ceasing. If we are to succeed in our lives as believers, we must resist the devil and his temptations. James puts it this way, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now in Matthew 13 from verse 24, the Lord Jesus gave the parable of the weeds and the Bible says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? An enemy did this, the Bible said. People of God, we need to understand that there are a lot of things in this world, a lot of good, but also, this world is full of a lot of evil. 
There are a lot of things that the enemy does and tries to do in our lives, and we must be aware to his schemes. The devil, or Satan, is the sworn enemy of God and human beings. And I want you to get this. The devil tried to assert his authority, or the authority he thought he had over God in heaven first, but he was cast down. And then the devil tried to assert his authority over Jesus in the wilderness, but he was cast down yet again. And now in this present day, he's targeting us as believers. So I want to tell you that we too, as believers, through the authority that's in the name of Jesus, we too can cast the enemy down from our lives. We can cast the strongholds in our lives down through the power of the blood of Jesus. Whether you believe it or not, there are spiritual forces at work behind the scenes that we cannot see. There are forces of light and darkness that are out there seeking to influence the human heart for or against God. The gift of spiritual discernment then allows the believer to discern when there are spiritual forces at work in the course of daily life. I need you to get that. The gift of spiritual discernment allows you to discern, to identify when, when there are spiritual forces at work, good or bad. I am increasingly finding that the lines are being blurred more and more. There are too many things being presented as good when they are in fact evil. There are too many people who have a godly appearance but their intentions couldn't be further from God. Have you ever heard anyone say something along the lines of, I sense the presence of God in here, or something about him is just off. Something about her being here made me feel uncomfortable. Maybe even the phrase, something about it just doesn't sit well with me. Perhaps you're familiar with these phrases or phrases similar to them. They all speak to some kind of ability to discern things that are unseen, things that are unspoken and generally hidden. The dictionary definition of discernment is simply the ability to judge well. A secondary definition relates to spirituality and it says perception in the absence of judgment with a view to obtaining spiritual guidance and understanding. In other words, spiritual discernment is the ability to see, hear, and understand spiritual things that are not readily seen, heard, or understood. Now, it's important for us to establish what discernment is not. Discernment is not intuition. It's not your gut feeling. It's not a superpower. It's a spiritual gift given to believers for spiritual purposes. Spiritual discernment is something provided by the Spirit of God to lead and guide you to His will. It's an intentional process by God to bring us into cooperation with His plan for our lives. Here's an exercise to do. Take a moment, be honest, and think about everything that stands against God's Word. Look at how the things of the devil are being normalized today by society, by entertainment, by music. Witchcraft is being normalized in today's society, as though the Bible doesn't say, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Look at how fornication and adultery is being normalized as though the Bible doesn't say God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Just really take a step back. Look at what is being normalized today. Is God's idea of marriage reflected in entertainment today? Is God's idea of living faithfully, loving your neighbor, keeping your heart with all diligence, is that being reflected in the world today? Paul in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13, speaks concerning spiritual discernment. And the Bible reads, 
These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. One important distinction in this verse is that spiritual discernment is intricately tied to the Holy Spirit. Discernment comes from the Spirit of God. It's not something that comes from being a good judge of character. It's not something that comes from oneself. It comes from God. It's a spiritual gift, just as the Word of God also says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 10 that, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, different kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. God gives us the ability, through the Holy Spirit, to discern between various spirits and forces in this world. At the heart of spiritual discernment is spiritual warfare, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Saints, pray for discernment. Pray for discernment because these lines are not just being blurred outside of church, but in the church too. How many people are wearing the label of Christianity, but they aren't living a life dedicated to Jesus Christ? How many preachers are standing behind a microphone and saying everything but the name of Jesus Christ? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's why we need discernment. Things are changing in this world, and we need the Holy Spirit to enable us to see clearly. There are two spirits in operation in this world, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 1 John chapter 4, verse 6 says, We are from God. Whoever knows God, listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So we absolutely need to pray for discernment. And perhaps if I put it this way, my message will really seep into your heart. The devil has been deceiving people for thousands of years, meaning that he has experience he has the know-how. He has been working to deceive the children of God since Adam and Eve. I say this not to praise him in any way, but instead, I'm saying this so that you might be realistic and recognize that if you try and stand on your own, you will fall. If you try and fight the devil's deception on your own, you will fail. We need Jesus. We need to be filled with his word, and we most definitely need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that we can have this discernment that I'm talking about. Saints, we need spiritual discernment. As a people who are called to be separate from the evil of this world, we need to always have Jesus Christ at the center of our hearts. We need him at the center of our minds and forever on our lips. Walk with discernment, saints. <laughs>